This morning, I invite you to turn to me in, in your Bibles to the book of Titus, and we're looking at qualification number three, and qualification number three for what it means to be a pastor. And so we've been looking at this uh, the past couple of messages. Message eight, we saw the high priority of godly leadership in the church. In message nine, we saw that the first qualification is one who is above reproach. A man has to be above reproach when you hear his name. The first thing that comes to mind is not scandal, it's not, it's not crime, it's not uh, neglect of family. The first thing you hear is a man who is godly, a man who has honored the Lord. Not a perfect person, but a person who knows that he's not perfect and goes to the Savior who is. Uh, message 10, uh, last week, Pastor Andrew showed us that a man has to be a committed, uh, committed to faithful love. Uh, and what we saw there is a man must be a one-woman man, a man who has only one faithful love commitment to a particular woman, not to multiple women, not, not in the case of adultery, uh, in the case of, of uh, a faithful covenant marriage, we see this qualification that a man has to be a one-woman man. Now, uh, we also said that if a, a pastor is single, a pastor is single, uh, that can, he can still be a pastor. The qualification, it doesn't limit that single men uh, are pastors. It just says, affirms positively that if a man is committed to a woman, he has to be a one-woman man. Now, uh, a man who is single who has committed fornication and is in the act of fornication as a believer uh, would not be qualified for pastoral ministry. Why? Because they are not committed to faithful love. They are not committed to God's view of marriage. They're not committed to the covenant of marriage. So uh, although it doesn't disqualify single men, single men can also uh, be disqualified by their association with multiple women. And now today, Today, we're looking at committed to faithful fatherhood. A, a pastor must be uh, committed to faithful fatherhood. I just want to read the passage before we begin, do some review, and then dive right into the text. So this is Titus chapter 1, verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, Paul is talking to Titus, so that you might put what remi- remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife... And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it." So I hope you're taking this list every single day of what it means to be a pastor, and I hope you're praying for the pastors of Sheridan Hills, praying through these qualifications and praying through these objectives. Let's just review briefly. Uh, The apostle Paul and Titus served the Lord together for many years proclaiming the gospel and establishing local churches everywhere they went. So Paul and Titus are longtime comrades in the gospel. They've been partnering. Uh, We also see that Uh, They constantly had to deal with false teachers. This was early on in the life of the church. The church was still growing. It was was kind of an infant in its infant stages. And as a result, it it brought in many false teachers, uh, false doctrines as a result, and ungodly worldly behavior left over and left over bondage to the Mosaic law. So we see all of these compounded. And now Titus is dealing with cleanup. Cleanup on aisle church. Um, so he is dealing with the problems, and in several of the letters, like 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, we, we talk about uh, a hatchet man. What does a hatchet man do? A hatchet man goes and cleans up the shop. You know, he just goes in and he gets things done. And Titus is that type of guy. I mean, if you're going to send a person to uh, the church at Corinth, who are you going to send? Titus. You're going to send Titus. Because Titus is going to show up and he's going to say, okay, we've got a lot of work to do here. And then he's going to report back to Paul. So in, in first and, first Corinthians and Second Corinthians, you see Titus mentioned as, as one of the men who went to go relieve some of the, those false doctrines, false teachers, um, ungodly behavior. And he and Paul partnered together. 
Uh, number three, Paul's first concern for Titus is establishing godly leadership in the churches of Crete. And that should be your primary concern for the church today. What are the, God, what are the leadership of that church like? Are they godly? Are they uh, like God? Are they Christ-like? Are they being conformed to the image of God? That should be your concern. It was Paul's first concern, and it should be your concern. Number four, qualifications for elders, pastors, spiritual leaders are given in 1 Timothy and Titus, and you can add to that 1 Peter 5. Just write that, 1 Peter 5. Go home and read 1 Peter 5. What are elders, pastors, spiritual leaders to do? By the way, let me just say that there are only two leadership positions in the church. Two primary leadership positions in the church. And we're not talking about uh, other men who are leaders who are helping facilitate things. We're not talking about that. We're talking about two offices. And the two offices in evangelical churches are only pastor and deacon. Pastor is elder, bishop, overseer. And deacon is somebody who serves, helps around helps with uh, any type of ministry that is overflowing from the pastor's responsibilities. Those are the only two offices that the scriptures teach us. Now tradition will teach something else. So you, miss, you must decide, do I wanna hold fast to the offices of scripture set forth here or what tradition says? And in tradition, there's several offices in the church. But for our purposes and for what the scriptures teach, because Sheridan Hills is a Bible-believing church, we hold there are two offices pastors and deacons. So this church has two offices, pastors and deacons. So those qualifications can be found in 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, and 1 Peter 5. Number five, both lists begin with the same quality, with the same overarching quality of having an upright reputation, and specifically, somebody who is above reproach. Remember what I said is that if you call his name, if you say his name in your mind right now, you should not be thinking of anything other than a man with whom I find no fault. Now, in our passage, the verse that we're focusing on is this, uh, verse six, part B, where you read, and his children, the pastor's children, are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So if you have that, you can just circle a couple of things. Circle, his children are believers, and circle that because there are two common interpretations of this verse that we'll get into in just a minute. And you can also underline not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. And that's how we split the verse up. We split it up first with this claim that children are believers and the next, the, the clarification of what that means not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So if you're looking at this hierarchically, you, you see first that a man must have children who are believers, and what does Paul mean? They are not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now, to not be open to a charge is simply saying above reproach. His children are above reproach. It's a top-down situation here. The father is above reproach, his wife is above reproach, and his children are above reproach. That's what we get here. Now, the two common interpretations, and you're going to have to fill these in, of the phrase, tekna ekon pista, which is just a fancy way of saying, or the, the normal way of saying, children having belief is one translation, or children having faithfulness. Now, pista, the word pista is, is the word for, general word for faith. It could be viewed actively or passively. When it's viewed actively, we're saying, I believe, I pistas, I pistas, that's what you say. Um, so when you say that, you're saying, I believe, it's the active form. Now when you say, I have belief, I have faithfulness, I have faith, you're saying the passive. You're saying the passive voice, you just have something. But you're not actively using a verb here. So it's a verbal adjective, and that's important because translators have really debated how to translate this. Look, for instance, at the New American Standard. Now, we just read it in the ESV. Some of you read the New American Standard, which is a word-by-word -word translation. If it's a word-by-word -word translation, that means that it's accurate, right? Well, it's complicated, because look how it translates it. Having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. So the New American Standard Version translates having children who believe. In other words, children which we are led to believe, who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
These children must be Christians. Now, the King James Version, which is the version that we've used for several hundreds of years, the NASB only came out in the last 50 or so years, and it's, uh, it's variants, but the King James Version now says, having faithful children. Uh-oh, so what do we mean here? Now, the, the two common interpretations we'll get to in a minute, but let me just compare, to help us, let me just compare 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. Let me just compare what Paul expects of pastors in Timothy and what he expects of pastors in Titus. Let's compare them. In, Ti- in 1 Timothy 3, verse 4 to 5, he says, he must, that is the pastor, must manage his own household well. Now, circle manage. It's important. It happens twice in this passage, and it's very crucial that you understand that a pastor is a manager. It's not just a pastor who does spiritual things. He's also a manager who does practical things. Not that practical things can't be spiritual, but he is one who is, has the ability to administrate and organize. He must manage his own household well, and we're not just talking about, uh, we're not just talking about you know, waking up early and, and making breakfast for the family. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, in this time, a man who oversees usually the family business, who oversees servants, who oversees the cash flow and the outflow, who manages his wife's affairs as well, uh, her bi- uh, dealings, her businesses, who manages his children spiritually, but also in terms of trade, uh, training them to learn the trade. Now, how many of you in here who work have taken your father's trade? Now, just raise your hand if you've taken your father's trade. Just raise your hand really high. Be proud of what your father taught you. Okay, look around you. It's like four people, I counted. These lights are so bright, I can't see. But it's like four people. Now, this is not true in this society. A man who manages his household would have provided not only the inheritance, but also would provide the skills needed to continue on the legacy. So if your name was, you know, blacksmith, what did you think your father did? He was a blacksmith. Your last name is blacksmith. That's what you did. You're a blacksmith. Um, You know, a a leather, uh, somebody who bound leather had a name that went with that. So this is what we're talking about here. A man who manages his household is constantly aware of this legacy that he's leaving. So that's what it means to manage. It's kind of a lot. With all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Now underline submissive or circle it because when we see in the parallel, 1 Timothy 3 is supposed to be a parallel of Titus and this passage does not say that they need to be believers. Oh, The Bible contradicts itself, I don't believe it, just walk away from the faith right now. No, don't do that. The Bible doesn't contradict itself, it gives us a prism of where we should view, of how we should view life. And so one part of the Bible might say a particular thing about this prism, and then another part of the Bible might say the other side of that coin, the other side of that prism. And when you look through a glass prism, it all looks jumbled up and confused and messy, but when you align it properly, you can see that it's all colorful and it's all unified. So this is what the scriptures do. It shows us parts of what this looks like. In verse five, 1 Timothy 3, verse five, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, again, there it is, manage, underline it, it's important to manage, how will he care for God's church? It's a good question to ask. If a pastor can't manage his household, how can he care for the church? The answer is rhetorical, he can't. If he can't even give a legacy to his children, to continue in his footsteps, if he can't even provide for his wife and family, if he can't even manage the affairs of his servants and the cash flow and the inflow of, uh, the outflow and the inflow of cash, how in the world is he gonna manage this dynamic uh, body of Christians multiplied at 100 times? How can he do it? And the answer is he cannot. Now Titus 1, 6b and to 7a gives us these uh, descriptions. His children are believers, you've already underlined that, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now here's the deal, look what, it, look what it says here, for an overseer as God's steward. Now circle God's steward and make a line to manager, because what is a steward? A manager. Now Titus and First Timothy, Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 agree here, but there's a bit of confusion on this children having belief and children having faithfulness or being faithful. 
The two views are, let me start first with this one view, children having belief. This view says that Titus 1 verse 6 refers to children of any age that are believing Christians. They have to be believing Christians. However, the reference to debauchery suggests that Paul is referring to grown children because a young child can never, in any form of the word, be guilty of debauchery. Now, debauchery simply means somebody who is lewd or wild or drunken. It just refers to a lifestyle. Think of the prodigal son. How old was the prodigal son when he left? Not old enough to claim his inheritance because we know that because he asked his father. So he's probably young. And he left, took his father's inheritance, and was living, living a debauched life. He was in debauchery. Now, that's a bit of what the picture of debauchery looks like. So they say, people of this view that children have to be Christians, say that when Paul says debauchery, he means grown children, grown children. This, this man, this pastor, has to have grown children who are Christians. But number two, pista, the verb for faithfulness or belief, is used actively here, and it's better rendered as belief, to believe. It's a verb, and it needs to be viewed that way, and not as faithful, which is passive. And that's in 1 Timothy 4, for example. Faithful pastors. Timothy, your responsibility is to raise up pista pastors, faithful pastors. Now, it's assumed that they're believing, because if you don't have believing pastors, then they're not faithful, obviously, which is the third point. Unbelievers are never in Scripture referred to as being faithful. They're never referred to as being faithful. So the proponents of this position would say, therefore, children having belief means an elder has to have children who are Christians. Are you tracking with this? This is crucial. It's important, and we'll get to why, but it's important. So that's number three. Unbelievers, people who do not have Christ, are never described as faithful. So why would Paul say that children have to be faithful and not mean that they have to be Christians. They have to be Christians. Now, the fourth thing that this view holds to is that if a man has children that are too young to understand the gospel, they have infants, children who are not at the age of accountability, who do not understand, then 1 Timothy 3, verse 4 and 5 applies. That is, they must keep their children submitted. They must discipline their children. They must use corrective discipline and penal, uh, penal discipline. That means they have to teach, instruct positively, but also uh, use the rod negatively to teach their children to be submissive. Okay, so that's the first view, children having belief. Now, children having faithfulness, that translation, here's the four things that this view holds. Number one, the translation faithful is preferred to belief because Paul's use of the phrase not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination clarifies behavior and not status. So the prodigal son lived how? What behavior did he have? He squandered his living on all sorts of evil, wicked things, and he acted a certain way. Now, there's no doubt when we read that passage, you don't think, wow, the prodigal son is, is a Christian who's kind of steep. No, you think, man, this guy's not a Christian. So they would say he is, that the children need to be faithful and that just implies behavior. Now, if you compare that number two with 1 Timothy 3, it makes more sense because Paul in 1 Timothy 3 requires that children are submissive, which is an act of behavior. It's not an act of belief. It's not a status. Number three, this view also holds that an elder's children must be professing Christians. Um, that view is too complex. It does not answer enough questions. For instance, why do we say that a man has to be, has to have believing children when we are not responsible for another salvation? That's one of the questions you have to answer if you hold the first view. If you hold the second view, what you have to answer for is, why aren't the pastor's children Christians? Sure, they're faithful, they look good, but they're not Christians. Uh, so that's, the, the problem here, the objection is, why aren't the pastor's children Christians? Number three, the view that an elder's children must be professing Christians is, it, like I said, is complex. Therefore, it is more likely Paul meant the simpler translation, which is that they must have faithful obedience. So all I'm doing is presenting the views to you and helping you see the complexity of the issue 
But we're going to get some more with this. I don't want to leave you with doubt. And finally, number four, the children having faithfulness interpretation is preferred because it is unlikely that Paul requires something that a father cannot control, like his child's salvation. Ultimately, God is the God of salvation. A father cannot control this. Now, let me just, let me just uh, make a brief statement about that last point. Um, the lists describe things that a man is in control of. Uh, you know, it's easy for you to stop being so abrasive and be being, you know, stop being so quick-tempered. That's an easy thing for you to stop being. Uh, self-control, well, it's not easy. It's probably difficult, but being self-controlled is a thing that you can kind of work on. Uh, being patient, uh, being um, faithful and um, a faithful manager, those are things you can work on. But a child and their belief, can you work on that? And so that is, that is a really difficult question that we must ask of our pastors. We should ask, why aren't the pastor's children saved? But we should also ask, how can we pray in such a way that the pastor leads his children to Christ? So that's, that's a, a brief comment there, but it's complex. Now, here's what both interpretations agree on, and I, here's what I want to leave you with. Both interpretations agree, and you can fill this in, both of them agree that a man must exercise spiritual leadership in the home if he is to exercise spiritual leadership in the church. The home is the proving ground of effective spiritual leadership. It is the proving ground. A pastor with children will do whatever is necessary to nurture his children in obedient behavior and saving faith. Behavior is an expectation. Saving faith is the goal. Obedient behavior is the expectation. Saving faith is the goal. This, this nurturing of a child's active obedience and saving faith is what it means for a pastor to be a, a faithful father. So this is what it means for a pastor to be committed to faithful fatherhood. Now, let me just tell you right off the bat that what I just did was shoot myself in the foot. In a war, you sometimes have, um, what is it called when you shoot your own people? Friendly fire. Friendly fire. And I've just shot myself in the foot, and I've also given you the ingredients for a mutiny. That is, you can take these passages of Scripture now and use them against all the pastors you know. Now, here's what I don't want that, that, I don't want that to happen. And here's why I shot myself in the foot. So now I can shoot you in the foot. Now, here's what we're going to do for the next couple minutes of our time together. We're going to look at fatherhood in general. Because I do not think that pa holding pastors responsible for their fatherhood while you yourself are not being held accountable for your fatherhood is fair. I don't think that double standard should exist in our churches. We want to go to a church where the father's family is intact and yet our family at home is out of whack. So what we're going to do is take a step back, look broadly at the issue of fatherhood and where Paul gets this from. Now, let me just make a caveat, two caveats. Paul does not require a man to have biological children in order to be a pastor. As far as we know, Paul was single and did not have children, and Jesus did not have children either. And he's called the good shepherd, the pastor. Number two, I should also add at this point that faithful fatherhood does not negate the need or the role of women in either the church or the family. Just because we're talking about spiritual leadership in the church is bound to manhood, fatherhood, we're not saying that women are somehow useless in the church. Titus 2 gives a clear indication and gives a clear importance of the women's role and the essential role they play in the life of the church. Read Titus chapter 2 in the same letter. Paul says this is what women ought to be doing in the church. They ought to be raising children to love fatherhood. They ought to be teaching women to marry men who will be committed to faithful fatherhood. How essential is that? So I am not negating the role of women, but the text is focused on fatherhood, so that's what I want to focus on. Now, do you know what's so remarkable about Titus chapter 1 and 1 Timothy 3? Do you know what's remarkable about them? They're not remarkable at all. It's what God requires of every Christian. 
To be a pastor is to be a Christian. So much so that the requirement for pastoral ministry is nothing other than a call to be a Christian. You might write that down. The call to be a pastor is a call to be a Christian. Several of the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus are outlined in the fruit of the Spirit. For instance, a man is to be peaceful and not violent. That's one of the qualifications. Or patient, not quick-tempered. That's one of the qualifications. Uh, they should show goodness. They should be faithful. They are God's steward. So there are several things in the fruit of the Spirit that we see is applied to general, generally to Christians that's applied specifically to pastors, and that's because there's nothing remarkable about being a pastor other than you're just a normal Christian. Now, there are some things that are unique. For instance, in Ephesians 4, it's, we're told that Christ gives good gifts to the church, and of those good gifts are teachers, pastors, evangelists. So, in a unique sense, a pastor is called to full-time ministry, and has to be able to teach. So those are unique ways in which a pastor is called into ministry, something that not all men can do equally. So Paul teaches Christian husbands, for instance, and wives, just to show you that pastors should be Christians, how to treat their spouses. He teaches husbands how to treat their, sp their spouses and how to treat their children in Ephesians 5 and 6. We would, be, we would, be, uh, we would not be interpreting the Bible correctly if we said, a pastor, I want my pastor in my church to love his wife and to care for his children, and you neglect your wife and neglect your children. That would be a hypocrisy. And it happens much, much of the time. Now, the, 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 the opposite side is true. Pastors who want members to have great families when their family is not intact. That is also a problem. But we cannot get away from the standard that God places on us. We have to be Christians. And those are the first two standards of what it means to be a pastor. He has to have a, a wife, a one-woman man, and he has to be a faithful father, a loving husband and a faithful father. Nevertheless, churches today have la lost track of the biblical teaching on true Christianity, and that's what the problem is. We have lost track of what it means to be a true Christian, and now we appoint people who are not truly Christians because we don't know what it means. I believe this problem that the church in general doesn't understand what it means to be a true Christian, I attribute it to two predominant factors that have, have taken place in the last two millennium. In the first place, some have rejected the standard of what it means to be a Christian and consequently what it means to be a qualified pastor on the grounds of what I call progressive spirituality the belief that holds to floating truth untethered from the Bible or any standard. So this is what's been happening. Some churches today believe that the call for men to become pastors is oppressive and patriarchal. After all, times have changed. Don't you know we had a sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s? Come on, man, get with the times. Pastors can now be women, too. So the times have changed. We should change too. Progressive spirituality. Let's progress. That's what it means to be a true Christian. Getting with the times. The second movement, which is owing in large part to high church evangelicalism. By high church, I just mean all the bells and whistles, all the garments, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And it's what I call detached spirituality. The belief that regular churchgoers, commoners, and church leaders live in two separate classes, the commoners and the spiritually elite, where the spiritually elite are detached from and worship apart from commoners. These two movements were on the one hand, everything goes, everything's permitted, just get with the times, man, be progressive, and on the other hand, where the tradition of wearing funny priestly garments is the fad. As a result, we have sidelined the Bible and the basic teaching of Christianity, and consequently, what it means to be a true pastor. So those two things, I think, have really morphed our view of what it means to be truly a Christian. Ask yourself, am I truly a Christian? 
And what does your mind immediately go to? Do I look like the culture? Am I like the culture? Or am I among the spiritually elite? If that's where your mind goes to, you do not understand true Christianity. But if your mind goes to what does the scripture say about what it means to be truly Christian, then you're on the right path. I think you're not far from understanding what true Christianity is. We have to be careful of these two dangers. Namely, be like the culture, to be like Christ, makes no sense, and be among the spiritual elite, a class that does not exist in the church. Pastors are not above parishioners. Pastors are Christians and fellow believers with their brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no righteous standing that I have apart from Christ. Being a pastor will not get me into heaven faster than you. Trust me, brothers and sisters, if we both were to die right now, we'd both hit the gate at the same time. Because Jesus does not show partiality. He gives faith to all people who believe, not a spiritually and commoners. To be clear, let me just be clear about these two movements. They are like rat poison to a rat. Very delicious and fatal. It is very popular to become part of something that says, let's be like the culture. And it's also very popular and attractive to be part of something that says, let's just be spiritually elite. Both are deadly because both miss the point, mark of what it means to be a true Christian. And here's how they miss the mark. If you think that the Bible changes and that there really isn't absolute truth, how do you know that your view is absolutely true? You can't. In fact, you can't even know if you're here today. Now just to be safe, pinch the person next to you and see what happens. Make sure you're really here. Now, if you think that the church of Jesus Christ is divided into spiritually elite people and common faith people, then what does that say about your God? Isn't he partial? We have to see that Paul's teaching on spiritual leaders is not something he made up to fit his culture and that he did not intend to create a class division in the church. Paul knows that male leadership and in particular faithful fathers in the church are part of God's good design and plan for his people in the church and society at large. Name the biggest problem in society today, and I tell you, among your list will be fatherlessness. I want to show you this morning that this teaching about faithful fatherhood is grounded, first of all, in God's very own character. God's very own character, and in the second place, in the scriptures. Now, when we look at faithful fatherhood grounded in God, in his own character, and in the scriptures, we'll be able to answer some difficult questions that face the church today. So we're gonna look at what are the, the challenges that face the church today. And so with that, I wanna dive right into the example of faithful fatherhood in God. Number one, God is the eternally perfect father. You have to understand this about God the Father. And there are several passages, I did not put any passage from the New Testament because I do not want you to think that this is a New Testament idea. God's fatherhood, the image, of God as Father is in the Old Testament. And there you go, 15 times I've given you scripture references that you can go home to and look at. God is referred to as a Father in the Old Testament, and this image of, of God is also among the images that we see of God as a rock, as a husband, as a judge, as a lawgiver, and as a warrior. This is an image of who God is, and the image of Father is not a result of men writing scripture and saying, let's project our view onto God so that coming generations can argue about whether God is feminine or masculine. That is not what people intended when they wrote down scripture. God, the image of him as father is God's self-revelation. He told us he's a father. We didn't tell him he's a father. Now that's important because if you struggle to love your earthly father, you will have a hard time loving your heavenly father because your earthly father was a jerk or whatever, insert blank here. You will have a hard time loving your heavenly father. And what I want to dismiss for you is the notion that we project fatherhood onto God. You should not think of your earthly father 
as an image of what it means to worship the Heavenly Father. You should think of your earthly father as a, an outflowing of the Heavenly Father, whether good or bad. Now, here's, here's where I'm getting this from. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 4 to 6, here's what we read. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. There's an image, the rock. A God of faithfulness, there's the word faithfulness, and without iniquity, just and upright is he. They have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. He's talking about Israel. They are crooked and twisted generation. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you? So he's a father that creates. Now, it's important also to mention that we can't get away from using the name father because Jesus uses the name Father over 165 times in the Gospels. It is, it is his preferred image of how to refer to God. Heavenly Father. Isn't that not how he teaches us how to pray? Heavenly Father, holy is your name. That is the formula that Jesus uses, the image that Jesus prefers. We see, first of all, that God the Father is a father in the sense that he is the first person of the Trinity. So God as father in the Trinity is used over 40 times in the Apostle Paul's letters. Grace and peace to you from God our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some would argue that uh, we emphasize way too much uh, father and son. And I wanna tell you today, actually, what, who's the most neglected member of the Trinity? Absolutely not the Spirit. We've got a charismatic church just down the street who's emphasizing the Spirit this morning. The Father is the most neglected member of the Trinity. We love the Spirit. Give me the gifts of the Spirit anytime. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. We want Him to be crucified on our behalf so we can be saved. We love His resurrection. But the Father? Almost as absent from Christian theology as fathers in society today. Because when we recoil at the fatherhood of God, we push it aside. Just to give you an example, this past week, I looked over 20 theological books, and I could only find two that talked about the fatherhood of God. Out of 20, whole chapters dedicated to the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ and his lordship over, over creation and salvation, Chapters dedicated to the fruit of the Spirit and how the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. And a measly paragraph on how God is a father and that's a good thing for the church because uh, God loves his creation. What? The fatherhood of God we will see in Scripture is so rich. Do not neglect this person in the Trinity. So he is the father and he is eternally coexistent with the Son. We cannot talk about God the Father without talking about God the Son. And we cannot talk about God the Son without talking about His Father, God the Father. They go hand in hand. And as such, He is our Father in a very different way than He is Jesus' Father. Jesus and God the Father are uncreated. We are created. And the only way that we can call God our Father is through adoption in a new covenant. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him can we be adopted and, be, and call him father. God calls the nation of Israel his son several times and that is possible through covenant. God makes a promise and he clings to his people and he calls him his son. Now the nation of Israel as God's son failed to obey God as a true legitimate son would. In Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 3, 19 to 20, God says, how I would set you among my sons. He's talking to Israel. This is right after the Babylonian judgment. He's, he's, about to ju he, he's about to destroy them for their neglect of his care, neglect of his personhood. And so he comes and he says, okay, I'm gonna neglect you now. You broke covenant, I'll break covenant. So he says, how I would set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, a heritage most beautiful of all nations. And I thought you would call me my father. Underline it. The Lord is speaking here. I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Surely as a treacherous wife, 
leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. So now we have a problem because early on into the Bible, God's legitimate son, Israel, abandons him. So now God is somewhat sonless, and Israel is fatherless. Now here's the deal. What happens across the Bible is we get this progression, and we see that Israel failed to be a good son, but now in Jesus Christ, the title of son is fulfilled. Out of Egypt, we hear when uh, Joseph, Mary, and, and Jesus fled back from, uh, went back from Egypt to, to uh, Bethlehem, we hear, out of Egypt I have called my son. And now the word is talking about Jesus Christ. When Jesus is baptized, it says, this is my beloved son, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So, Jesus replaces Israel as the true legitimate son. And as Jesus, as the son, Jesus perfectly obeys his father. This pattern of obedience, father, son, obedience. And part of the eternal plan between God the father and God the son is the father's plan to sacrifice his son who would die willingly so that he can honor his father and obey him and so that God can become the personal father of all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was forsaken by the Father. My God, my God, my Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me so that all who believe in Jesus can hear not only the forgiveness of their sins, but my beloved children in whom I am well pleased. All fathers and mothers at Sheridan Hills must know how to lead their children to the Lord Jesus Christ by showing them the love of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, and the transformation of the Spirit. Do you know that? Brother, sister, if you're a mother, father, single mom, single dad, do you know the gospel? So not only is the Father the first person of the Trinity, but he is the creator of all people. He is the creator of all people. God the Father um, is the creator in, in a very general sense, and the number one criteria for being a father is you have to be a creator, <laughs> right? Fathers create. What do they create? Sons and daughters. So they are creators. They image their God in that way. God the Father, in a general sense, is the father of all people because he created everybody, and this does not mean that all people will be saved. We're not, I'm not teaching universalism. The belief that just because God created all people and he's the father of all people, in a general sense, that all people will be saved. We know that this is not true because Jesus said the road to destruction and hell is wide and many follow it, while the road that leads to life is straight and narrow and few go on to that. So I'm not saying that universalism is true, but I am saying that God is the father of all people in a general sense. We all have a maker that we will meet in judgment. You will meet your maker. Whether you are in Christ and love God and have a personal father, or whether you are out of Christ and have a general sense of a heavenly father. You will all meet your maker because God is first and foremost our creator, and as such, he demands our allegiance. And when we don't give it to him, we deserve punishment and death. Now, God is also the provider of all the universe. God is also the provider of all the universe. And theologians have described the invisible force at work in the world, in the universe, that keeps things moving and well-oiled. They have described this as the providence of God. Providence is, uh, uh, the, the doctrine of providence is simply uh, a doctrine that says God provides for us in a general sense and in a specific sense. Now in a general sense, in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10 to 12, we see that God is great and power and glory belongs to him and that all the heavens and the earth is his. Now God can do whatever he wants with the heaven and the earth. In Matthew 10, 29, we read that two sparrows are sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. God knows when birds hit the ground, 
Remember that hunting uh, trip that you went on last week when you shot a bird you weren't supposed to? God knows. It says right here. Not one of them will fail, fall to the ground apart from your father. The state might not know that you did it, but God knows. Matthew 5, 44 to 46 shows us in a general sense that he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. This morning the sun rose and you were under it and so were wicked people. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So it's not just that you were having a bad day and it started raining and it got worse. You're, you might be righteous, but the guy driving next to you who was hoping for rain got the rain, not because God somehow loves him more than you, but because in a general sense, God makes it rain on the wicked and on the righteous. That's the providence of God. He orders the world in this invisible force, and we call it the providence of God. So God is an example to us in faithful fatherhood in very practical ways. He's a creator. He creates. But not only that, he provides. Ah, interesting. What does a husband do? What does a father do? Provides. So in, in, in a very practical way, are you like God? Do you provide for your family? So we've seen that he is always a father as well. Remember, he's the first person of the Trinity, eternal. Now, what is not true of fatherhood today in society is their ever presence. God the Father gives us the example of sticking around by showing us that he's eternal. There will not be a moment when he ceases to be father. He will always be father. And yet in society today, fathers are not eternal. They're disappearing. This is because we've fundamentally misunderstood the nature of God. Now, the way forward is to continue to root ourselves in who God is. Forget about the past, move forward. Think of who God is now. You can still be the father that you haven't been by looking at God the Father. You can still pursue righteousness in your family even though you've not been the father that you need to be. Now I'm speaking to fathers directly, but mothers who have the task of raising their children by themselves, is it not good news that you have a heavenly father? That you have a husband is another image in Christ? What does it mean for you to not have a husband who's a father to your children? Well, it means that you have to have a grasp understanding of the fatherhood of God. That's what will get you through that hope. So he's the creator, the provider, and sustainer of all life, and he's eternal, he's always present. And now we're moving from general to specific. The next thing we want to see is that God is a graciously good God. He's an eternally perfect father, but he's, he's, he's a graciously good father. So in a specific way, God provides for his people. And God's name says it all. God's name says it all. Father says it all. God appears to Moses in Exodus chapter 34. He comes down. Moses is working on the tablets, and he is working on the Ten Commandments. And God comes down, and it says in Exodus 34 verse 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, with Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now, what does the name of the Lord mean? It's a, it's a mouthful, so just follow along. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Now here's his name, right? The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Hi, Lord. That's his name. That's how he introduces himself to us. Now what are some key things that you see here? That the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and there it is again, faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations. 
but visiting iniquity merely to the third and the fourth generation. I thought that when we read the Old Testament, it was the other way around. He only showed loving kindness to the third and fourth generation, but showed anger and wrath and judgment to the thousands of generations. That's not the God of the Old Testament. You're reading the wrong Bible. Exodus 34 says that God visits iniquity to third and fourth generation. That's a grandfather, a father, a son, and a grandson. At most. But he says, if one of those break tradition and become a Christian, now you've got a great grandfather, a gra a grandfather, now you have a father, and everybody underneath that father, his whole generation, to the thousands will be marked by God's loving kindness. It's pretty powerful. After God destroyed Israel for oppressing the poor and taking advantage of the fatherless and widows, he promises to restore his people in Jeremiah 3, 32, verse 39 to 42. In, in Jeremiah 32, he says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. And I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may, turn, that they may not turn from me. And I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I have brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I will bring upon them all the good that I promised them. How many times does God say, I will bring them good? What is your image of father? Is God the father a good father? This passage shows us four, at least four times that God is going to show good to his people. Not to mention Romans 8, 12 to 17, where God promises that he will give us a spirit, not of slavery, to feel like we're in bondage, but a spirit that cries out in freedom, Abba, Father. And not only that, when you call him Father, you also get inheritance. You'll get all the riches of the world. Spiritual, in heaven, you'll have the whole world will be yours because the Father promises an inheritance. We could go on, we could talk about Ephesians, we could talk about Hebrews chapter 12, we could talk about God's gracious goodness and blessing us with spiritual life, choosing us to be holy, predestining us for adoption, redeeming us, forgiving us, lavishing us with his grace, revealing his mystery, uniting, us all, uniting all of us together, sealing us for the day of redemption. We could talk about how God loves us like legitimate children by disciplining us, you don't discipline illegitimate or somebody else's children. You discipline your own because you love them. We could consider God's graciousness for several hours and still not scratch the surface of what it means for God to be graciously good. But it is important for us to capture the essence of his grace toward his children. Parents, do you imitate God in the way he lavishes good gifts to his children? Are you known by your name? When your children hear your name, do they hear, uh-oh, belt? Uh-oh, I don't wanna go to Thanksgiving dinner with that, no. -uh. Or do they hear the most loving, kind, generous, gracious person I've ever met? What is it? What do they hear about your parenting? When your children talk about you, do they talk about you favorably or do they avoid you? And perhaps you're single, perhaps you don't have children. Are you cultivating these godlike characteristics in the way you treat people? Do people know you by your name for these qualities? The call to faithful fatherhood is not only seen in God's character, but we also see that the, faithful, the call to faithful fatherhood is seen in the scriptures. I've made several lists here and I hope you take them and look at them. They're all from the Old Testament. I want you to see why it's important to emphasize fatherhood. Fathers, faithful fathers understand in the first place that masculine identity to be a man is rooted in creation. In the first two chapters, we have a working thesis of what it means to be a man. 
A man is to bear the image of God, have dominion over and subdue creation, partner with his wife, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, work and keep the garden of Eden, obey God's commands and impart them to his family lest his, he and his family die. And that's just in the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, Adam fails miserably because in Genesis 3, we see that he couldn't protect his family. He failed to bear the image of God as a representative by allowing Satan to eat. He failed to have dominion and subdue the snake, the serpent. He did not partner with his wife. And he did not keep the garden. And he did not obey God's command and brought judgment on his whole family. He failed in all respects to be a true man. So what happened that leads us to today? Our broken society, our broken world. Faithless fatherhood. You see why this is a big problem in the church? Because faithful, faithless fathers destroy churches. Just like Adam, at a larger scale, destroyed the unity that we have with God. We're gonna look at that in a, bit, in a bit, but before we do that, I want us to see number two, that faithful fatherhood, faithful fathers understand that having authority, which is a good thing, always goes hand in hand with fulfilling responsibility. Faithful fathers who want authority have authority because they fulfill the responsibilities. If you do not fulfill your responsibilities in society, in the church, in school, in work, in all these avenues, then you don't deserve authority. Now, this can be applied broadly to men and women. Authority always has with it responsibility. Always, there's never a separation. A faithful, responsible father in the Old Testament, for example, modeled faith and commitment to God, reminded his family of God's salvation by leading them to observe festivals, celebrated the traditions of the Exodus, managed land and possessions according to the law of God, provided for his family's food, shelter, clothing, spirituality, and rest, protected his family from threats, served as a representative for his family at the assemblies, at the gatherings, maintained peace among his family members, made personal decisions that would benefit his family and society, consecrated his firstborn to God, delighted in and loved his children compassionately, guarded his own reputation to not bring shame to his children, taught his children wisdom, disciplined his children so that they could learn obedience, ensured an inheritance for the coming generations, and warded off unsuitable male suitors from his daughter. That's what it means to be a faithful father in the Old Testament. That is no less true today than it was thousands of years ago. Faithful fathers do those things and more. We haven't even touched the New Testament. And there's a whole chapter on discipline. Hebrews 12. Please take this list and put it in your bathroom. Just cut it, paste it. Because what you need to see is fatherhood is the very fabric and essence in the Old Testament of the functioning of society. Let me give you an example. King David had four sons. We all know King David made drastic errors in his leadership. He uh, took Bathsheba to be his wife at the expense of Uriah, his best warrior at his expense, at the expense of his life. He lied, he showed deceit, and when confronted, he, didn't, he, he poured judgment on himself cluelessly, just without realizing what judgment he was pouring on himself. And remember, David was God, it was man after God's own heart. Interesting. So what happened? David told Nathan, when Nathan confronted him, this man should pay back fourfold. And how did the man pay back fourfold? David paid back with his four sons. Amnon raped his sister, his half-sister. Adonijah led a revolt against his father. Absalom took the, king, the kingship, and Solomon had more than a thousand wives and made political allegiances with Egypt. The people who you're not supposed to like, they kept you in slavery for several hundred years. When we read the commentary of how David's kingship failed and how his sons turned against him, how that fourfold curse was fulfilled, 
Do you know what 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 6 says? He never asked his son, why do you behave like this? That just should send a shiver down your spine. The commentary for why David was a bad king is because he never asked his children, why do you act the way you're acting? He was busy sleeping around with Bathsheba. And at the expense of the kingdom, because here's what would happen. Remember, with the legacy we live on as fathers, David had Solomon. Solomon made political allegiances that were no-no, and then showed his son, taught his son to be foolish. Rehoboam launched a civil war in Israel and split the kingdom and brought upon God's judgment. Do you see how far fatherhood stems? David was dead when Rehoboam was on, in the scene and making these decisions. David was long gone. And yet fatherhood destroyed the fabric of society, destroyed the religious assembly of Israel, destroyed the unity that God had with his people, led other leaders by example to oppress widows and orphans. I mean, how important is fatherhood? It's crucial. Uh, before we end, I want to draw our attention now to the goal of faithful fatherhood in the church today. The goal of faithful fatherhood in the church today. Certainly, there are several examples that we can look at positively. We've looked at one example. God, our Father, perfect, never makes mistakes. And we can also see several other examples in the scriptures. But right now, what I want us to do is focus on three things that we can do, Sheridan Hills can do, to help this problem. Number one, Sheridan Hills, we can help this problem move forward in hope. We must grasp that faithful fatherhood, or lack thereof, is a spiritual issue. This is not a societal problem. It's not an economic problem. It's not a... It's not a familial problem, it's not a education problem, it's not a school problem, it's not any of these problems before it is a spiritual problem. Remember, I said that we have abandoned God's design for manhood, and this is where we find ourselves today. But the way forward is to remember that this is a spiritual issue, and because it is a spiritual issue, the hope that we have is the spirit of Christ in us who helps us win these spiritual battles. If we want to change society, do not look at society and say, look at society. Look at the church. This is the first place we need to look. Look at Sheridan Hills. Look at other churches. Look at the church in general. That's where it starts. The solution starts here. Now, Here's where it starts. Here's how it starts. Here's how it works. This is what Jesus and the New Testament writers understood so perfectly, and this is what we must grasp this morning. There are many of you here today who do not have children, and you might even be single. And here's how it's a spiritual problem. Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 10, 28 to 31, he's talking to male disciples here, and he says, Peter says to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus says, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now. In this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Now, why doesn't he mention fathers in this list? Because he's talking to men who are supposed to be spiritual fathers in the church. So when we look at Jesus, he says to us, Sheridan Hills, you might not have a father and you might not have children. You might be a single mom or you might be a single lady with no children. But guess what? In the church, though you do not have children, you have children. Though you do not have fathers or mothers, you have 
fathers and mothers. Now, let me clarify this because what I just said is pretty counterintuitive. What, I don't have biological children, so they have spiritual children, what does that mean? Titus, in the letter, in the first chapter, what is, how does Paul refer to Titus in the, in the letter? My true child. Remember, Paul didn't have children. How does he refer to Timothy? My child of the faith. How does he refer to the Galatian church? My children. How does he refer to the Corinthians? Though you have many teachers, you do not have many fathers. How do we know that? Because nobody's rebuking the Corinthians. What does a father do? He rebukes, he exhorts, he encourages. So who is the father of the Corinthian church? Paul. In the first, uh, in the John, in first John, the letter that uh, the apostle John writes, what does he call the children repeatedly? Children, my children, little children. Who's their father? John. John didn't have children, biologically. He had spiritual children. What does Paul set forward in Titus chapter two as the goal of the church in terms of discipleship? Older men ought to teach younger men how to be self-controlled. What do we have there? Father-son relationship. I only take care of my children, my biological children. I don't care about anybody else's children. I just care about my children. Not in Christ's community. Uh-uh. In Christ's community, all these little kids you see running around here are your children too. It takes a village. What are older women to do with younger women? Be their mothers. Teach them how to care for the house. Teach them how to love their husbands. Teach them how to be self-controlled. Isn't that what a mother does? But now he's calling all of you, brothers and sisters, to be fathers and mothers in the church of Christ. And all of us who are young ought to be children, not begrudging children, but loving children. Do you see that faithful fatherhood is a spiritual issue? It starts with the church. Number two, Sheridan Hills must seek, must seek men who are faithful at home to their biological children to provide spiritual leadership to spiritual children in the church. Brothers and sisters, I, I ble- beg and plead with you. Seek men who are qualified to be pastors in this church. And finally, I told you I would shoot myself in the foot, so, uh, and I shot some of you in the foot, so this is good. But finally, pray for me and all the other pastors and deacons in this church. I am humbly asking you to pray for us. Pray that we would be spiritual leaders that are, spiritual, that are faithful fathers. I think when we do that, the church will, will be a blessing. I think when we do that, the church will change society. And I think when we do that, our God, our Heavenly Father, will be glorified because we bear His image and we obey his word. Let's pray.